All right. So it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today. It's David Burke, and he's going to tell us something about uh, uh, characterizing Alexandra Spaces with curvature bounded above by means of a Kirchhoff's inequality. Right? right. Thank you. No. I'm impressed by that feat of memory. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to start by putting a drawing that I will often refer to here on the sideboard so I don't have to keep um, repeating it. This is, this is four points and the simplex defined. And since I guess the talk has started, it's proper for me to say that this talk represents joint work done with Igor Nikolaev. Now, we have a definition of the quadrilateral cosine, where I will often suppress the zero because it just gets in the way in the case of cat zero. And the quadrilateral cosine of two um, segments oriented segments in a geodesic metric space. I will be, for simplicity, dealing with the, geomet with the geodesic space throughout. It, we can extend things a little, but it'll make it easier for everybody to understand if I stick to the ge geodesic space. Now, what this represents in the case of the Euclidean plane would be the genuine angle between x and y when they are translated so that the tail of x coincides with the tail of y. This is something that should be verified, but I will just state it and hope you believe it. Now, I'd like to what Eager and I proved, one of our f first results, was that if you had a um, geodesic space, M rho, I'm going to want to put some other things there, so I'll put this here, M rows are metric, and it will be a R zero domain also known as a cat zero space, if and only if for all x, y, cosc, now suppress x, y, is less than or equal to 1. This implies that the absolute value is less than or equal to 1. You can see that by reversing one of the vectors, but I will just leave it in this form. OK, I'd um, like to start right out by explaining the significance of this. One of the questions I'm asked is, so who cares? Zero yes. Yes, that's for cat zero. There's a similar characterization for every uh, k, but I will start with the zero case. Now, the question that seems to come up is, uh, who cares? Why is this different from any other cat zero space? Man nishtanah have kept four point condition haze, they call four point conditions. Well, um, consider the canonical construction for um, a non-cat zero space. Incidentally, after pondering it for a while and attending several talks where people just use the blackboard, I was impressed by how even though it's impossible to cover as much, it seems to be much better for the audience. 
So I think this old-fashioned method has a tremendous advantage over transparencies and their equivalents. It's slow, but it's possible to follow. Now, I just... One, these are the lengths, one half, one half, one, one, and square root of three over two, plus a little epsilon. Now, I believe that most people here will be familiar with the fact that this is sufficient to guarantee that these four points with their corresponding distances cannot be embedded in a cat zero space. The, one of the useful defining conditions is that the length of any segment from the vertex of a triangle to the midpoint of the opposite side is less than or equal to that in Euclidean space. This is longer than that, so you're done. It's impossible to be a cat zero space. But let's look at these four, let's look at these four um, vector, well, there's more than four, but let's look at any pair of these uh, segments. Suppose I'll, I'll call this as an example y bar. This will be x bar. And um, using the notation I have there, this will be A, this will be D, this will be Y, this will be X, this is F, and this is B. Now, it's clear that if I take any pair, say cosc, for example, x, y, as written, will necessarily be less than or equal to 1. Um, you can see that because it's approximately this. I, I told you that these were the, the cosines in Euclidean space. Uh, let's assume you believe me. It's clear that this is close enough to a Euclidean space that this angle between these two will come out to be quite far from zero. The only time when you pick up an angle zero is right along this line segment, and that's just dandy. This will not interfere in any way. So there, if you have two adjacent segments, since you're just computing um, triangle values, the cost will automatically be less than or equal to one, so there's no sense in even computing them. But there's a um, few pairs to look at, but if you look at them, you see that where this is the obvious assigning of vectors to the um, segments with those lengths. And one other possible case So all these costs are less than or equal to one, fitting the criterion which I have announced to guarantee that it is a cost K space, uh, it is a cat zero space, and of course it isn't a cat zero space. But the point was that it had to be satisfied for all X, Y in the space. This is not yet a geodesic, it's not yet a geodesic space. So let's make it one. And let's attempt to deny the conclusion of our theorem. 
Um, that is, globally, for these, we see that it's less than or equal to one. Let's try and keep it less than or equal to one. And of course, our efforts will be frustrated, or else we have to resign. Um, now, the first most obvious way to make this a ge geodesic space is why not just leave this configuration as the space itself? It's perfectly respectable. Just chop it up using the lengths that are the most obvious, Euclidean lengths. And this, this uh, wire network makes a reasonable geodesic space. However, suppose that you ever have two paths of the same length. Well, this doesn't look too plausible. I'll there. Suppose you ever have two paths of the same length connecting two points somewhere along here and up here. OK. If we, uh, let's, for simplicity, let's just let this length be one. Uh, somewhere, going it this way, schematically, somewhere you have a place where the two um, segments differ. So we'll just take for any row where the two are not the same, just take these two segments. Now I say that it's clear that's always risky, it's clear, but it's true anyhow, that the cosc of these two segments must be greater than one. Because if they lined up, well, that's a judgment. The cosc would be equal to one. It's simply um, recognizing that the cost does, does evaluate the genuine cosine. OK, but there's one extra there's one extra term in the calculation. That is, we would have had one without the D. So as soon as the D, non-zero D, is put in, we necessarily come out with something greater than one. So without any calculation, we see that this way of constructing a geodesic space, well, I ought to write this. Um, I'll just say costs greater than, greater than one. If I call this segment A, and this segment B, cosc of AB, is greater than 1. So that's, that says that this way of um, trying to make a geodesic space out of this is fated to um, have the cosc greater than 1 somewhere. All right, but there's a yet more natural way Suppose that we. Uh, I'm sorry, why is that? Uh, why, what? why is that greater than one? No, why does that imply that uh, your wire space here is not. Uh, oh, because somewhere I will, I will have this path and this path somewhere from here to here is zero, from there to there, something greater than zero. So as you, as you, you know, adjust, somewhere you will have two paths of the same length, about, say, oh, here and there would be the same length. Somewhere you've got to have it because you have the circuit. OK. Um, we can do the same anywhere. But that's enough to say that that's cheap way out doesn't work. But there's a much more reasonable way of making a geodesic space of this. And that is make it a sphere of the correct, uh, of the correct length, depending on the epsilon. This would fit beautifully on a sphere. OK, um, so on the sphere, suppose I take any segments and 
any segments, um, no matter how small, no matter how placed. It's approximately the same as in Euclidean space. These casks, you can see that the angles are far from, far from zero, except in the case where you actually line up on a geodesic. And so they're f f far away from zero. So the slight adjustment you have going from Euclidean space to a large sphere, let us say it's the, let us say it's the uh, size of the Earth, um, so you can't observe it, is still is going to keep all of these cosks, all these cosines of segments on the boundary bounded away from one, except when you're actually on a segment and then they're exactly one. So looks like it's uh, a counterexample in the making. However, if we put a sphere in here, um, just imagine looking down on it somewhere, you have a section that a section that you're looking right down on it from the pole. Okay. Well, if, if you were, if you took the Euclidean, if you took the Euclidean uh, values and Euclidean cosc, you would get one. However, if you glance at this, you see that the, extra, the increment in length for S is more than the, proportionally, more than the increment over a, small, a smaller segment. So um, that is it's the relationship of the sine to the, to the angle. So um, S is greater than square root of 2R. And that, that spoils your cosc being one. Immediately, it's somewhat bigger. It's 2s squared. If you do the computation, you get 2s squared minus 2r squared over 2r squared. And because s is greater than square root of 2r, you're finished. All right, now you're now left to your ingenuity to try to put in other geodesic spaces, preserving these lengths. And no matter how wisely you charm, somewhere you're going to find yourself with a couple of geodesics and the cost greater than one. Don't know where, this whole space is free for your imagination, but somewhere you're stuck. If you put a hole in, it's obvious you have this case that I just erased. If you try to make it a nice surface of some kind, somewhere you have a problem. You can put solid blobs in. It's perfectly possible that the geodesic span will pick up a little solid chunk, who knows? It's up to the malice of the person designing the, the space. But somewhere we know that we will pick up a cost greater than one. And this is the result of the difficult part of the implication that if the cost is always less than or equal to one, then you must have a cat zero space. So, um, what this was designed to do was explain why this is different from the cat zero, con from, excuse me, from the uh, four point conditions which amount to recastings of Alexandrov's uh, original criterion in all sorts of mildly combinatorial ways. 
but supplying no extra information. Whereas in this case, I claim that there's, that there's something that you know now that you did not know before. And now I want to get, um, I had spoken on this many years ago, but without, without emphasizing this aspect of it because it never occurred to me that people did not um, understand what was going on. Okay, but now I would like to leave the zero case and discuss some rather strange things that happen in the non-zero case. So uh, can I erase this? Thank you. Now things begin to get much more um, complicated and some strange things begin to occur in the case of COSC 1, still the same notation, but the COSC, I mean, of what these um, lengths represent, but the computation looks more complicated. So COSC 1 of xy, this is that of design for the sphere, unit sphere, is equal to, as you probably guessed, 1 plus cos A times cos B plus cos X, cos B plus cos X cos Y, Um, this doesn't look like it will serve too well as a blackboard, so minus cos x plus cos d cos y plus cos f. And this whole thing is over. 1 plus cos A sine x sine y. At first glance, this seems quite unlike this, but they really are. Um, as analogous as is possible. If I find myself with extra time, I will write that out. But for now, I will just ask you to accept the fact that what this is is the cosine on the sphere of x and y. If you parallel translate x to y along the sphere, and at the tails of the vectors. That's important because the translation at one point parallelly is going to give you a different value from the translation at another point. Um, for, for example, if I s simply take the equator and a pair of meridians, Here's the pole. I will, I'll continue up to a little less than the pole. These are clearly parallel measured here and not parallel if you took this to be the tail. So if you reverse the vectors, it is not the case that parallels stay parallel. If you run along the vectors, it is not the case that parallels stay parallel. Um, I think this is reproducing one of the constant causes of trouble in people's attempts to prove the parallel postulate. The belief that if you took a straight line, a geodesic and something that was at the same distance from it, that you got another geodesic. But, you know, not, it sounds inviting, but not so. Okay, 
Now what Eager and I proved is that if necessary and sufficient, that a, geod that a geodesic space of diameter less than or equal to, this is what I want to talk about today, one of the things, pi over 2 on which cosc is less than or equal to 1 is necessarily a cat 1 space with the same bounds, the same diameter bounds. So you see it again? What yes. Um, if I take a geodesic space of diameter less than or equal to pi over 2, then necessary and sufficient that it be a cat 1 space, still I can't talk about it beyond the diameter I've given, is that the cosc is with, measured this way is less than or equal to 1. Now this... You don't mean pi, you mean pi over 2 in the diameter? Pi, yeah, that's right, that's why this is interesting. Pi is what you would hope, but it's just not so. When I last discussed this, I but showed... Then, I mean, then this theorem does not apply to the union sphere, does it? Uh, you know, well, to a section of it. Ah, but not to the entire thing. Um, strangely enough, it turns out that the unit sphere does fit, but that does not follow. That's just a statement that I, I make. But it hap But just being less than or equal to one is not enough. If I take a sphere of radius of radius greater than one, everything falls apart, or not everything, but enough falls apart as soon as you get beyond pi over 2 to make this false. In other words, just, yeah, if I take a, if I measure, and I'll do this, if I measure this as if it were cat 1, and I take a sphere of radius greater than 1, including, including Euclidean space, it is cat 1, but if I go out beyond a diameter of pi over 2, I will find that the cosc, this, the cosc fails. The, the last time that I spoke on this, I showed that this worked up to pi over 2. And at the time, we thought it was just a technical problem, that uh, with more cleverness, it should extend to pi. But um, I will produce counterexamples and the reasoning behind them to show why this surprising, somewhat surprising result uh, holds. Yeah, it is. I was surprised too. We were surprised, but there it was. We're busily trying to prove it and prove it, and suddenly there's a counterexample, <laughs> and that makes the proof more exciting. Okay. Now, for you're naturally wondering about minus one. A similar, a similar um, result holds, but there is no diameter. I won't bother writing it out. There's nothing to do on minus one. There's no diameter problems once you get to negative k, just as there are no diameter problems with zero. OK, now, how, how does this arise? Uh, what's going on? Okay, the, the difficult part of proving this theorem technically was to show that if you had a cost bounded by 1, then you had a cat 1 space. The um, statement that if you have a cat 0 or cat 1, cat anything space, that you get a bound of 1 was, seemed essentially trivial. I'll write out the 0 case and then see what almost what goes wrong in the one case. It's very interesting. And the zero case makes sense to write out first just to see how life should go. This is necessity. Here we are, x, y, um, b, a, 
way. And a... Um, Now, a beautiful theorem of Reshetniak's says that you can always turn this curve into a convex curve on the domain that we're speaking of, in this case, Euclidean space. It doesn't look too exciting the way I have it constructed, but it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a beautiful thing in such a way that every, you have an isometry on the edges, but you have a non-expanding map from, the, from here, Euclidean space, to the space that you wanted, the original space. This is M, this is E2. Is that one difference? Well, all I care about is that it's, all I care about is that all distances here are less than or equal to the distances here. Now, um, if, let's look at cosc xy. And I, as I say, I will only have to worry about less than one. You might, as an exercise, worry for everything I do about greater than minus one. It just cuts the amount of time down to just do all our work in one direction. Okay. This is, say, x twiddle, y twiddle. Cosc x twiddle, y twiddle. Is certainly less than or equal to 1 because you're in Euclidean space. And as I said, in Euclidean space, you're um, in Euclidean space, your cosc was your genuine cosine. All right, here, I guess I should say this, I should write this. This is an R0 domain, echo height, a cat zero space. All right, we look at these two lengths. They're less than or equal to the lengths that we had on Euclidean space. That is, looking here at our formula, d squared and f squared were smaller than what was needed to get less than or equal to 1. Therefore, this is smaller than the comparison rectangle or it shouldn't call a rectangle, a quadruple. So this is less than or equal to 1. It's easy and beautiful. Um, we didn't, it wasn't as, uh, without the Reshetniak idea, without knowing some of these things, it just wasn't as obvious, but it is. OK, now let's look at the, let's look at the one case where things appeared to be Equally obvious, Reshetniak's theorem still applies to so all is well until you look more carefully at these values. And you, if you're down around zero, no problem. A larger d means a smaller cosine. Larger f means smaller cosine. Everybody's happy. No matter how far out you go, less than pi, larger d means, um, larger d means smaller cosine algebraically. 
larger f means lar smaller cosine algebraically. But because you have a product here, it is possible that these minuses that you're getting turn into pluses if you go too far. And so suddenly you realize that the comparison, while correct for length, can conceivably begin to go the wrong way for the formula. Now this, first I want to show you that indeed that happens. And secondly, if you're feeling suspicious, you say, wait a minute, that should be a problem even once you get past pi over four because then conceivably this could get greater than pi over two as you straighten things out. And conceivably this could get greater than pi over two, leading you to suspect my statement that pi over two is adequate. Well, that turns out not to be the case, not because of a bald statement of Rorschach-Nyack's theorem, but an examination of the reasoning behind it, which, um, will rescue us. You, you can't simply, in, the theorem is but the guinea stamp for the insight to the gold for all that. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what does the standard thing called the four point condition, the cap zero four point condition, what does it Well, say? there's lots of four, there's I mean, bunches of them. Kind of flavoring of the diagonals, you know, or, or comparison for derivatives, no? Well, if there's one that's the same as ours, I want it. No, no, no. If there's uh, another I'm, one, uh, <laughs> it's mine. I'm, I'm misremembering this. I was just yeah. trying to see whether or not you actually need Richard Nyack's theorem, you know, at least in this case, and not of the derivative. Oh, okay. When uh, we originally well, did it. There is some version of the four point condition which is directly applicable with this equation. You know, to, to, uh, when we originally did this, he did not use Rorschach-Nyack's theorem, but it does simplifies things. It just simplifies things tremendously. Sure. Well, if you have a configuration that looks like this, you can just say, um, I mean, just going to the definition, you say to yourself, go to the correct crossing point what would be the correct po crossing point in the Euclidean space, you get a path. That path is by the definition, by the four point condition, that's the definition practically. This is short, this is short. It provides a path so the whole thing is shorter. So that's it, nice and easy. But then you begin to say, well, suppose the original configuration was such that these diagonals did not cross in the first place. So then you got a special, then the inequalities go the wrong way. You got a special case, it still works, you still can straighten things out, but you, you can't just recite that the uh, crossing length shortens it. But if it's a convex type configuration, then it's, you don't need the definitions enough. And yes, you can deal with all these by hand. Okay, so let's see back to um, where we were. So let's just produce the um, let's just produce the counterexamples. I want to show that I want to sh produce cosc ones that are greater than one. Okay. Um, well, here is the easiest one that I know. pi over two plus epsilon, um, pi over two. Um,
pi over four, pi over four plus epsilon. And let's call this D. Okay, if you go through your computations for this, you will end up with, I will save you the um, unpleasantness of computing them, and you will end up with um, one half, one over the square root of two, cos epsilon, plus two, um, sine epsilon, cos d, divided by one over the square root of two, cos epsilon. So which sides are you using? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, good question. This here is x, and here is y. Yeah, thank you, Bob. It's correcting. Uh, okay, there we are. So, um, okay. Now, Rochetteniak's theorem still applies, but let's just, if we look at this, we see that if cos d is greater than pi over two, um, excuse me, d is less than pi over two, then cosk will be greater than one. Now, if you think of this as a sphere, d will be somewhat um, greater than pi over two, because you're tapering from pi over two to pi over two plus epsilon, you'd be a little bit bigger. But there's no requirement that you stay on this, this particular sphere. If you can make d a little shorter by simply making the sphere a little larger, uh, the, as the law, uh, um, if you're familiar with this stuff, you realize that as you make your curvature smaller, the length to a midpoint gets sm smaller. And this is awfully close to a midpoint, and the same reasoning applies anywhere proportionately. So it is perfectly possible to achieve d less than pi over 2 by enlarging, this, by enlarging the um, space on which you're working and thereby reducing the curvature a bit. You don't need much. And if you want to check, if you work this out on, say, Euclidean space, just to make sure it really happens before you run off the board, you find that d is plenty short. So somewhere you run into that. Surprising, I mean, trivial once you got it, but uh, just the surprise that it occurred. Okay, now I want to go rescue myself now from the other possibility that everything went wrong at, before I got to pi over two. Well, what can happen, what sort of your extreme case, pi over, pi over two, pi over two, we're a little less than pi over two, but obviously this is easy to draw. What can give you your, your largest expansion for Rochetteniak's theorem? What can cause you the most trouble? Well, a configuration like this. Now you could flip this. That would make it larger and convex. Okay, but that would leave this length no larger. You could, and this is in the spirit of the Rochetteniak construction, 
uh, just straighten it out. Okay, now this length is close to pi, but our diameter by hypothesis was no more than pi over two in the first place. And you have not, in, in this drawing, you've reduced it, but more important, you have not gone beyond your pi over two. So you never find, not so, but therefore I allege that you never find yourself in the situation where both of these are being pushed so far simultaneously that you find your sign flipping and giving you trouble as long as your x and y were less than pi over 2 in the first place. As you see, yes, you can, by example, find yourself in difficulty as soon as you go beyond pi over 2 for the x and y. But as long as you're short of that, the spirit of the Reshetniak's theorem allows you to stay sufficiently short in your convexification that you have no difficulties, and pi over 2 is indeed attainable and sharp. Surprise. Now this, um, if we have, Does anybody here know the time, please? 45. Wow. 47. 47. OK. Time does fly when you're having fun. OK, the um, this proof of the sufficiency for the non-zero cases fun, but it surely um, requires a good deal of time even being sketched. But there's something which we can talk about in just the remaining couple of minutes, and that is rigidity, because that too turns out to fail at pi over 2 in the, um, in the spherical case. First, let me do the zero case. Suppose that Kosk xy is equal to 1. And suppose it's always less than or equal to 1 for every, everything in the space. Then I say that the span of xy, the geodesic span of xy, is a section of two space. Now essentially the same proof works. Suppose that we have x, y, A, sorry, B, it actually makes a difference in the spherical case, A, D, and F. All right, we use Reshetniak's theorem again, and we have our comparison quadrilateral with, I'll call it D twiddle, F twiddle in it. Now the cosc is the cosc in the comparison quadrilateral is less than or equal is less than or equal to one. Greater than or equal to the cosc in the genuine quadrilateral. which is, by hypothesis, greater than or equal to 1, 
saying that the two are equal. Now, the fact that the two are equal, means, meaning D and F are, um, D and F are the same, because if anything, they, this D would have had to been shorter than that D twiddle. Therefore, they're the same. Therefore, they cross in the middle, because otherwise that would have a, a longer path. Therefore, these, this triangle, this triangle, this triangle, this triangle, this triangle, are all isometric. And once you have a triangle like this, with one leg the same, it's easy to see that all, not, I shouldn't say that, but one can verify that all the distances must be, must be the same. The whole triangle must be isometric. Because take the distance to any point in the middle, some point here. All right, this distance must be short because it's an interior distance, but it must be long because it's an exterior distance. So it must be spot on. So all your lengths must be identical. Now you have to do still reason about cross distances and the like, but um, grinding through everything is exactly the same. Now the same reasoning works in the one case, except once again with the difficulty that the larger lengths don't necessarily give you a larger um, cost. I mean, I mean, larger values here, I should be more careful. Larger, larger length, smaller cosine, negative smaller cosine, bigger, okay? So we have a counter example to the rigidity, which I have not written, but just said. We have a rigidity theorem in the one case, just as we do in the zero case. And it fails exactly at pi over two. Because, and I think this will exhaust everybody's patience. So I will just write this. Pi over two, pi over four, pi over four, pi over two, D. And it turns out that cosk x, cosk xy, will be equal to 1 as long as these values fall anywhere, which is not forbidden by triangle inequality. So I can fold d all the way back to pi over 4 itself. You can't fold back any further, but I can basically collapse the whole thing. I still got 1 but I surely do not have a span that fits on the sphere. I mean, this, um, this broken line back here actually represents the distance, and that is surely not the spherical distance. Therefore, the proof of rigidity fails at pi over 2. Quite a surprise there, too, but there it is. So pi over 2 turns out to be the crucial value for the what seemed to be the trivial part of the theorem that the cosk was less than or equal to 1. The sufficiency part of this, um, I think to everybody's relief, I will leave to some other occasion. That's the hard part. This is easy once you see it. The other's hard once you see it.
Okay. So, thank you.